Hello and welcome to Pickleball Therapy, the podcast dedicated to your pickleball improvement. I hope you're all doing well out there. We recorded the podcast a little bit earlier this week because I am currently up in Michigan playing at the Beer City Tournament in Grand Rapids and I'll be at the Kalamazoo Tournament, the Latitude 42 Tournament with our friends Jim and Yvonne Hackenberg next week. So we're recording this podcast a little bit early, but it's some really good content. It comes out of the summit that we had. CJ and I put together a summit uh, June 27th through the 30th. If you weren't able to make the summit, I'm going to link below to, uh, uh, I'll give you a link where you can check out more information about the summit and decide if you want to participate in some of that content. It's fantastic content. Today, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about learning, the process of learning, and, and some of the challenges that are presented when you're playing pickleball and you want to improve as a player. And in the riff, it's going to be really interesting. I'm going to share with you some numbers, some statistics. Don't worry, even if you don't like math, don't like numbers, these numbers will help you hopefully change how you see the game. Let's get into the podcast. You'd like to help your friend or family member learn how to play pickleball, but how? Now it's easy. Pick up a copy of Play Pickleball, A Beginner's Guide. It's the most complete guide to playing pickleball. Available as a digital download or in hard copy at intopickle.com or at Amazon. Let's keep growing the sport. As I mentioned during the introduction, CJ and I hosted the Pickleball Summit uh, last week. One of our guests was Glenn Peterson, national champion and senior pro player. And in conversing with Glenn, we discovered that he had basically been on a uh, competitive sports hiatus uh, from teenage years when he played some tennis in high school until he was 52. Picked up a pickleball paddle when he was 52, got introduced to the game, and then within a couple of years was winning national championships, uh, was compete, getting silver and gold medals and singles at every tournament. I mean, just playing at a really high level. And so when we're speaking with Glenn about it, we were just curious as to how he had basically gone from, you know, 52 year old, never playing pickleball to winning national titles within a couple of years. And one of the things that, that, that really uh, came through when we were speaking with Glenn was about the learning process, about the pickleball being a learning process. And there's always something to learn in pickleball. And we were kind of joking about it being a blessing and a curse at the same time, because, because there's always something to learn in pickleball. You never, you're never going to climb the mountain completely. So it's like this hill that's in front of you or this mountain that's in front of you and you're climbing and you just keep one step and one step and you just keep climbing again and again and again. And you're never quite going to make it up to the summit of pickleball, right? I mean, even if you become the best player in the world, there's still something else to learn in the game. And so it's, it's a blessing. I think it's a blessing at the end of the day, but it can be seen as a curse because of the fact that it's, it's this insurmountable challenge. It's a, it's a, hill that you just simply cannot climb or mountain you cannot climb completely so that's i guess you can view that as a curse if, if you want to and it can become frustrating right so it can it does create some challenges because it can be seem frustrating sometimes when you're sitting there feel like you're banging your head against the wall you can't you know you're not learning you're not you're plateaued you haven't improved uh things like that so you know like it's hopeless but the reality is that there's always something to learn right so if you look at it from a if you flip it around and look at it positively then that uh, you know, that sort of endless fount of, of learning gives you just constant opportunity for growth, not just as a pickleball player, but also as a person where you can basically uh, go out there and, uh, and just keep working at your, at your craft, working at, at this game that you become passionate about and, and just keep going. Right. And, and so the, the, the ability to be able to always learn in this game, I think you have to be careful about the, the potential pitfall of it, which is a, more of a mindset thing looking at it as this frustrating, never ending, you know, I, I'm never learning. I'm never, you know, I'm never good enough, things like that. If you can reframe that and, and really look at it more as a challenge and look at it as a, as, as a, just a gift, right? This ability to always grow. It's a sport that you're never going to become, uh, you know, it's, it's never going to become static for you, you know, where you're like, well, all right, seen that, done that. And what's next in terms of life or at least that sport, um, you know, there's always something new that you can add to your game. And when you look at the even the best players today in pickleball, you know, they're adding new serves to their game. They're adding new uh, new types of shots, new angles that they're trying to explore. If you look at, for instance, a, a player that comes to mind is Corinne Carr. Excellent player, uh, has a ton of medals at all levels. Uh, she was a high-level high, high level golfer uh, and then started playing pickleball. I think she played some tennis too, but she played, you know, pickleball. She you know, used to partner with Simone Jardim a lot. And so if you look at Corinne uh her Korean history or the history of her play, she played at a very high level. 
She got very good, won a lot of medals and things like that. And then all of a sudden, it's like some players started to pass her. Basically, like it was almost like the game was passing her by. Uh, some of the 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 game got faster, uh, got harder. Uh, you know, you had the waters coming in, Catherine Parentel, players like that, uh, Jesse Irvine, uh, Callie Smith. So you had these other players come in. And so now all of a sudden, you know, Corinne needs to evaluate herself and her play. So what does Corinne do? If you watch her play now, she's using a lot of angles in her game, which is something that, that wasn't uh, present in her earlier an earlier iteration of Corinne. And now you're seeing her reestablish herself as, as another, as, as a top tier player again. Why? Because she's she's learning new things to add to her game. Irina Tereshenko is always adding things to her game. Lucy Kovalova always adding things to her game. Uh, you know, even Simone Jardine adds adds parts to her game. The strategy that she's playing with, uh, to to you know, that there's always like Lucy Kovalova and, and Simone Jardine against the Waters against Lee and Annalie, and you see Simone Jardine's evolution, her her strategic evolution in those games. If you want to see that. Watch the PPA and Atlanta finals. It's a five uh, five game match between those two teams. A fantastic match, uh, but you'll see the evolution, and you can see some shots that maybe Simone a year ago against the Waters would have attacked. This time, she said, "Nope, I'm going to slow it down because she's learning. She's learning how to adapt to her opponent. So, learning is a process that that you know you just, it just never ends. And it's something that if you frame it that way in your mind, I think you'll find it much more enjoyable process, and you'll see the the gift that really that that endless fount of, of learning is. Also during the summit, we had the opportunity to speak with Coach Pete, Peter Scales. He wrote the book called uh, Mental and Emotional Training, Compete, Learn, Honor. Excellent book, highly recommended to you. Uh, and, uh, you know, Coach Pete's a friend of VI Pickleball, a friend of CJ and mine. We've become friends uh, over the last few months. I've interviewed him for the podcast before. If you haven't listened to those, go back to podcast episode nine and so on, and you'll you'll hear his interviews. They're fantastic and um, Coach Pete talks about basically learning is the great equalizer is kind of the way he frames it. Basically, it's like this. He kind of he says he he sort of laughs when he hears uh, when he hears somebody say that they've mastered whatever they think they've mastered, because the reality is that even the best athletes in ever, in any sport are always learning. And the example that comes to mind to me is when you look at two of the best players in the history of tennis that are pretty much household names, so Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal. When you look at those two players and their history uh, of playing together, they've played, I think, something like 33 times against each other. And usually when they're playing, they're playing either in the semifinals or the finals of tournaments. So they're playing at, the, you know, high level, high stakes kind of games. And so when you look at that, at the back and forth between those two players, it, it's interesting to see how each has pushed the other. So the, the example I'll focus on is Roger Federer. Nadal has a winning record against Roger Federer, something like 23 and 10. So he has, uh, you know, he's gotten the best of Roger more, way more than Roger's gotten the best of, of Raphael. And so what you see is you see what, what Roger did, what Federer did was he made an adjustment to his game to deal with Nadal. And what he did was he started to attack the ball sooner. So he started to take the ball sooner than he would have otherwise wanted to. So in his normal game, say he takes the ball at point X in the in its arc, he was taking it at X minus something, right? So he's taking it sooner and earlier. Why? Because of Nadal's what Nadal the, the threat that Nadal presented to his style of play. In other words, Nadal plays a certain way that makes Federer learn a new way to play in order to counter what's happening. So, you know, if, if Roger Federer is is on is in a lifelong quest to learn how to play tennis, and he's if he's not the greatest of all time, he's top two or three greatest of all time. Then I, I think the rest of us humbly should accept that we are all learners and we are all in this uh, to learn. And that's what Coach Pete talks about. He says that. No matter what your level is, no matter what your where you're at on your path or on your on your pickleball journey, everybody on the court is a learner. Everybody on the court is out there to learn, to improve, uh, to better themselves, both personally and also as players, as athletes. And so, if you if you come at pickleball that way, if you come at pickleball as a learning opportunity, as an opportunity to grow, you'll enjoy the sport way more than if you're just beating your head against the wall, frustrated because you haven't gotten to where you want to go. Hopefully this glimpse into what we learned at the summit helps you uh, better enjoy the game and also better, helps you better interact with this sport. It helps you have a more healthy interaction with this activity so that you see when you're out there and you're a little frustrated because there's something that, you know, just not clicking or something that you haven't quite uh, figured out yet. I was going to use the term mastered, but I'm trying not to use that. So I haven't figured out yet or solved that you see that as an, as just an opportunity, just something, uh, you know, part of your life, part of your growth. And uh, hopefully, uh, uh, it'll it'll make it more enjoyable. So in a second, I'm going to share with you some stats that are really going to help you understand, hopefully, 
how to play the game. Stay tuned for the riff. You've studied the pickleball videos, maybe read a pickleball book, taken a lesson or two, but there's just something missing, something to complete the whole picture. That's where VI Pickleball comes in. VI Pickleball is the most immersive pickleball learning community available today. You can check out more information at wearepickleball.com. See you in the community. If you follow CJ and I at all on Pickleball, you know that we harp on the advantage and disadvantage situation that happens when you play Pickleball. So every rally starts with one team, the return team, at a positional advantage and the other team, the serve team, at a positional disadvantage. So you'll hear us talk a lot about how one team wants to maintain its advantage and the other team wants to overcome its disadvantage. The statistic I want to share with you in this riff is the statistic about overcoming the disadvantage by the serve team. So let's let's break it down like this. If you have two teams that are basically identical, so let's talk about two teams that are clones of each other, so mirror images, you would expect if both teams are up at the non-volley zone line, it to be basically a 50-50 proposition or a coin flip, right? You know, if, if, if you if you jumped into a, watching a game and you saw two teams that were identical on each side of the net, and the ball was in play in a neutral kind of a manner, and I said, well, which which team's going to win? You'd be hard pressed to say which team's going to win. That's a 50-50 proposition, or whether neither team has a positional advantage. So in that situation, it would be fair for you to say, team the team on my left or the team on my right it doesn't matter because it's 50-50. One team or the other, the guess your guess is as good as mine as who's going to win that. So what happens is if you have those same two teams, again, mirror images, they're identical teams to each other. If you have one team that's the serve team, that team has a positional disadvantage until they neutralize it. So until they get up to the non zone line, they're at a disadvantage, meaning that if they stay in that position the whole time, if they stay at a position of disadvantage the whole rally, chances are that the team at the non zone, the return team, which has a positional advantage, will likely win the rally. The percentages there are sometimes there's around 70 to 80 percent depending on level and things like that but 70 to 80 percent of the time if the rally stays in a disadvantageous position for one of the teams the team that's in that position will lose 70 to 80 percent of those rallies so you would think that based on what we talked about earlier that if the team that's at the disadvantage right the team that's going to lose more often than not overcomes this disadvantage and makes it up to the non line it's basically changed its percentages from being down say like you know 20 to 30 percent 20 30 percent chance of winning the rally moves up to 50 percent but you'd be wrong what actually happens is the team that was down the team that was down at 20 30 percent chance of winning the rally when it gets up to the non zone line its percentage now jumps to 55 to 65 percent depending on level so what happens is you basically take a situation where you're favored to lose the rally and simply by making it up to the non zone line now you've changed the percentages to where now you are favored to win the rally. And remember the important, you know, there, there's the two rules that interplay here are the two bounce rule, which creates the positional advantage and disadvantage. And the other rule is the scoring rule. So in a situation where you, you, you're the only team that can score because you're the serving team. So you're the only team that can win a point, right? If you win this rally, if you take a situation where you're a 20 to 30% favorite and turn that into a 55 to 65% favorite, then guess what? probably going to win that game. And so what I want you to do is next time you're playing, I want you to focus on not winning the rally when you're the serve team. That's not your objective. Your objective is not to win the rally. Your objective is simply to neutralize the advantage of your opponents. Once you neutralize the advantage of your opponents, the percentages will work themselves out and you're likely going to win the game. If you like this kind of analysis, you like the, this way of thinking about the game, I highly recommend you consider VI Pickleball where CJ and I are together in there doing this all the time. Given this sort of analysis, this sort of thought process, this is how we approach the game, and it'll really help you, uh, you know, get to where you want to get to as a pickleball player. Hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. If you enjoyed it, as always, please give us a rating on whatever Apple or Spotify or wherever you're at listening to this. And if you enjoyed it, share it with your friends. If you liked it, they probably will too. Be well out there, and we'll see you next week.